Hospital Detention Board of Managers. And we're going to start, as we always do, with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're going to have our first round of public comment. And just a reminder to folks who come to the mic, we need your name, your address, but we also would like for you to limit your comment to items that are on the agenda only. No public comment? Okay, with that, we're gonna move on uh, for, to the approval of the minutes for the June 20th meeting. Board members. Make a motion approved. Second. All in favor? Uh, Great, thank you. So we're gonna have now a report out from uh, the juvenile Vice, Vice services. Sorry to interrupt, Vice Chair. Yep. If you just announced that there was an executive session yesterday. Oh, right. So there was an executive session of the board uh, yesterday at 4.30 p.m. Um, as always, executive sessions uh, limited themselves to matters of public safety. Kirsten, you're standing in for Chief DiMatteo. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, we currently have uh, three juvenile males in detention, two at Abraxas, one at Bucks County. We have one young male and one young female who are both direct files being held at the jail who have orders to return to a detention bed should one become available. I have one female direct file being held in Ohio. And then we have two direct files that do not have orders to return that are also being held at the jail and they are both males. So currently I have a count of one, two, three, four, five direct files, four of which are in jail, one who's in a juvenile detention bed and three males who are in detention beds for a total of seven. Thank you. Questions from the board? Direct files that do not have an order to uh, for a bed, if it becomes available, they're they're just in jail. Is that because of the nature of their crime, or well, how why would that be? That's because a judge has determined that they should, due to public safety, uh, there's like seven determinations that they use for uh, direct files. One is the juvenile's mental capacity, the age. Uh, whether or not it's a public safety matter, should they be returned to a juvenile bed or the community? Um, I can't remember all seven at the top, off the top of my head, but a criminal court judge has made a decision that they are that they should be placed in an adult facility over a juvenile one and stay there, and that's the proper place for them, according to that judge. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the board? Okay, hearing none. All right, we'll uh, move on to the report from uh, the Superintendent of Juvenile Justice Services. Mr. Irizarry. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, and thank you, members of the board. Today we have with us um, the Executive Director of the Children, the Center for Children's Law and Policy. As you all know, we've been working day in, day out uh, on a project that consists of uh, an assessment of our system um, uh, specifically in the lieu of a uh, lack of detention. So uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Jason Zani. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Arizari. Thank you, Vice Chair uh, Williams. And um, it's a privilege to be before the board. Thank you for allowing us a little bit of space on the agenda here today to provide an update on 
um, this initiative that we've been working on here in Delaware County um, with a great array of partners. Um, I'm going to try to be brief. This is really an update presentation just to give the board a sense of where we're at with things. We still have a good amount of work to do, but we've made some really great progress. Um, and I think we're on the road to being able to make some recommendations and suggestions for how to enhance the services and supports um, that are available to Delaware County youth particularly at the front end of the system. I'm happy to take questions along the way um, or at the end. So um, uh, please feel free to let me know um, if anything's unclear or if you'd like me to, to pause and feel the question from, from you all. Let's see. Okay. Um, so one thing we want to do at the outset is um, kind of give folks a sense of the values and principles that uh, guide our work and that guide assessments um, of this nature. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Center for Children's Law and Policy. We're a national nonprofit that focuses on reform and improvement of youth legal systems around the country. And a big part of the work that we have been doing uh, more and more of in recent years is really work focused on um, helping identify and build up those front end opportunities to try to prevent youth legal system involvement whenever possible um, and to try to redirect young people away from the system um, if they do have that contact in a way that's consistent with public safety and that connects those young people with what they need. Um, and so part of what we're looking to do um, as part of this assessment, it's not an assessment of Delco's entire youth justice system. It's not an assessment of probation. It's not a commentary on the size of a detention center if one is going to be built here. We're really, again, looking at those front end opportunities. Um, and one of the reasons we were excited to have this opportunity here in Delaware County is that um, it's a really important time to be taking a close look at where there are missed opportunities and missed connections to support young people in their own communities. Because ultimately, um, even those young people who are detained, even those young people who are at um, George W. Hill are gonna be returning to their communities at some point. And so we want to, as you can see up here on the slide, invest in the village as much, as much as possible. So understanding where young people are coming from who are having that contact and how we can resource um, things that either already exist in their communities that could be beefed up or strengthened, or to the extent that we're missing resources or opportunities, how can we think about providing those um, with that goal of um, having as many diversion pathways as possible? Um, as part of this work, and I'll touch on the various ways we've done this, we really want to center youth perspective um, in how we approach what's available and what is needed. Um, oftentimes, we find that systems have been structured um, with a lot of good intentions and with a lot of great resources, um, but that young people haven't necessarily had a, a stake or a say in what those opportunities and, and resources look like. So we really try to lean heavily on the voices of youth and the insights of youth. Um, acknowledging strengths, we know that there are a ton of strengths here in Delco. It was one of the reasons we were excited um, to be able to um, bid on this opportunity. Um, we think there's tremendous potential here. Um, there are lots of other exciting initiatives that are going on, and all of that's great. But what we do and where we really focus and try to add value is where are there either gaps or um, other opportunities to strengthen things um, even more. And it's all with the goal of trying to get um, the best possible outcomes for kids, which I know the board um, cares tremendously about. And what we ask in terms of commitment, in terms of doing this work is for transparency, honesty, and a willingness to consider other ideas. We never come into a jurisdiction pretending that we have all the answers or that uh, we know all of the ins and outs of the system, but we work very hard to try to educate ourselves as much as possible, to try to talk to as many folks as possible, again, with the goal of not creating a report that'll just sit on a shelf and make some generic recommendations and just say, do better by kids, but really identifying some specific ways that based on our experience, our national expertise, our experience in other jurisdictions around the country, that uh, some of those opportunities might be able to unfold um, in the places that we're working. Um, 
So one of the things I wanted to share, um, we're really, this assessment is really focused, again, on the front end of the system. So we're really looking at those early diversion processes and pathways. And um, the slide that I just had up, I'm sorry, that clicker is being a little finicky on me. Um, so this is Delco's um, current juvenile justice process map. Um, and you can see there are points at which um, young people can be directed either away from the system or out of the system. Um, and the one uh, box up here that I wanna draw folks' attention to, the top gray one that says diversion, that's really one of the key points that we're trying to look at in terms of this assessment. So um, if a young person is arrested or is at a risk um, of being referred to the youth legal system, what are the options that are available now that, again, could be enhanced or expanded? Um, and what are the additional options that could be available, again, to try to address the underlying issues and help support that young person as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, and as effectively as possible? Um, and that includes cost effectiveness as well. So looking at, again, those opportunities to support a young person in the community, not to divert and say, we're just diverting and there's going to be no response, but how can we connect that young person with a version opportunity that is meaningful and again addresses um, whatever those underlying needs are. So we're really trying to think about what that looks like currently and again what that could look like. Um, I wanted to share um, uh, another process map from Lancaster County um, here in Pennsylvania, um, because I think it's a good example of a map that really tries to build out kind of the different pathways, even at the point of initial contact with law enforcement that can be used as diversion options. Now, this is happening in Delco. We know this is happening. We know the youth aid panels are being used as a diversion option. We know that law enforcement um, will use warn and release um, or make direct referrals, and that's great. What I think we want to do is ensure that that's reflected in kind of how the system is structured, how folks understand it, and then again, how we can think about creating some of those diversionary pathways um, that will connect young people to effective interventions as early as possible if there isn't a need for involvement with um, the courts or probation. And sorry, I know this is very small. Um, I wanted to share if you um, scan the QR code and I will make sure the board uh, members have direct links to any of these resources. Um, we wanted to share an example of a diversion process map from another jurisdiction that has really taken an intentional um, approach to kind of building out those diversionary pathways in the community um, and really trying to connect young people to resources directly. And so this is from Los Angeles County, um, which has a newly create a relatively newly created division of youth diversion and development that has worked on building out a diversion ecosystem in Los Angeles County that identifies providers and resources in young people's own communities that can be direct diversion resources for law enforcement, for schools, and for families. And so this isn't to say that LA County is um, the right place to look to for a model that would work in Delaware County, but I share it because it is a good example of a process map where you really do get a good understanding, sorry, I'm not sure why this keeps jumping around, um, of the all the different steps that can exist and the opportunities that can exist at the very front end of the system um, when those investments are made in those community-based resources as um, diversion options. So um, again, that QR code links to a longer publication. It's actually a youth co-created publication that tells the story of how this approach to front-end diversion unfolded. It's really terrific, um, reflects the perspective of young people who were involved in creating the system, but also accurately kind of summarizes where things are at um, in LA County. Um, so I'm going to do uh, just a couple brief updates on the different components of the assessment that we have been working on. Um, and one of those is gathering youth perspective. And there are a couple of different ways that we have been um, trying to obtain that youth perspective. Um, we disseminated a um, online survey through Refuse to Quit Academy, RTQ Academy, to reach out to young people throughout Delaware County to obtain their perspective on what they are aware of in terms of services and supports, where they feel like there aren't adequate services and supports, um, and where they would want to see additional investments if the county were to um, choose to invest in things that would be most impactful for them. Um, we have about 500 
100 responses to that survey, um, which was targeted at uh, children and youth aged 10 to 21. Um, and we're currently working on analyzing that data, digging into the data, um, but I've provided some basic information about the demographics of the young people who responded. Um, we were happy that um, we had a majority of responses from uh, children and youth of color. Um, the age distribution tended to be on the older side, but we don't um, think that that's um, a problem. We do have a distribution across ages. Um, it's uh, overwhelmingly um, male youth responded, um, but we did have um, about a third uh, of responses coming from female. And then we did ask about geographic location in the county. So um, we had the largest number of responses from Fester, um, but we'll be able to break that data down um, by geography. And I'll show why um, that's important in um, just one moment. Um, we did also ask, um, it was an optional question, youth could decline to respond, whether young people had previous contact with police or probation or the juvenile court. Now, young people can interpret that question differently. Some youth may interpret contact as, you know, I see my SRO um, in my school, my school resource officer. Um, some may have interpreted it as something more along the lines of being taken into custody or an arrest. There was only so much we could do to try to get at that, but we at least did want to have a contingent of young people who did have some degree of contact with the system. And I think um, the initial data that has come in um, suggests that we um, were able to achieve that. We asked, uh, one of the questions that we asked were, if you had money to invest in resources for kids in Delco, what are the top three ways that you would invest um, that money? And you could see the top three responses up here, I think are not, they certainly weren't a surprise for us. I'm sure they're not a surprise to many folks, but I think it's important. Um, the top three things that young people would want to be uh, investing in were arts, music, opportunities, and opportunities for creative expression. That was uh, the leading uh, response. Um, and then mental health, behavioral, be behavioral health services, and mentoring. So again, I don't think these are um, surprises necessarily, and we'll be able to provide the full survey instrument to the board, and it'll be part of the report and recommendations when um, we finalize that. But I think it's telling that the first thing that young people were asking for um, was opportunities for creative expression. That's not necessarily a program that you would see reflected in a juvenile justice services curriculum. Uh, continuum, but it's one that's important um, for the well-being of kids. And so these are some of the questions um, that we asked young people, and we asked them to rate on a scale of one being agree to five being disagree, um, these different questions. And again, we are going to um, clean up the data and we'll be able to um, provide that survey data. Um, we didn't wanna rush to put something together. The results um, or the last responses really just came in um, in the last couple of weeks. So we wanna make sure the data are accurate. And we also want to be able to do some drilling down into the data. So this is one slide um, that captures that kind of, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Um, I know where to get information about services and programs for youth in my community. And you can see there are about a quarter of kids um, that agree with that. And that's a good thing. I think if the survey came back and everything was overwhelmingly negative, we'd be concerned because we know that there are services and resources that are available. So that's a good thing. What we're interested in doing is kind of drilling down into the about 60% of young people who either responded neutral or on the disagree end of the spectrum to look at where are those young people coming from? Are those the young people who have had that system involvement? Um, what communities, again, are they coming from and what resources are they saying um, aren't existing or that they don't have knowledge of in those communities? Because we have a decent sample size um, of about 500 youth, we think we will be able to drill down and kind of identify some themes. Um, again, not wanting to focus solely on the negative, but if we're really looking at opportunities for improvement, being able to look at the responses for the young people who fell on the right side of this chart, middle and right side of this chart, um, will be hopefully instructive and informative in terms of um, where the county might wanna go with additional front end diversion options. Um, 
I know that a contingent of our team, which includes um, Molly Cook, um, who I know is on Zoom from the National Assessment Center, um, and Anne-Marie Ambrose, um, who is a Stonely Fellow uh, working with the county, um, Annie um, and some folks here from Delco were able to do a focus group with five youth at George W. Hill. Um, so not a huge group, um, but I think a group that shared um, some of the challenges and some of the needs um, that they had and needs um, in their own communities. And again, I think these probably aren't surprising to anybody um, in this room, but um, when you think about um, kind of the needs and um, really wanting more programming um, for youth, recreational opportunities, um, mentors and advocates, um, credible messengers, um, those are things that do exist to some degree in the county right now. Um, but in our view, and based on the assessments, um, that we've done thus far, there's a much greater opportunity to kind of incorporate um, those opportunities. One other thing that I think um, came out in, as part of that focus group was a recognition of the young people who were there that they had caused harm and had done damage to their community and to the victims um, and that they wanted a way of repairing that harm. And I'll talk a little bit about restorative practices um, and kind of the there being a potential misconnection here on that. Um, but I think you see a quote from one of the young people up here on the slide that, you know, people make mistakes, everyone deserves a second chance, um, and that young people should be held accountable, but accountability can look very different than um, sitting up at the up at the jail. So um, some good insights. We're always trying to match qualitative and quantitative information um, as much as uh, possible when we do these assessments. And so turning to that, um, one of the things we want to do is uh, look at data on which kids are landing at probation, where they're coming from, what their offense profiles look like, um, uh, the demographics, um, so that we can start to think about, okay, we know probation diverts a lot. We know that they have a ton of services that they're bringing to bear for kids who have contact with the system. How could we think about either moving those services up um, or redirecting some of those kids away from probation um, toward a resource directly in their community. I know this has been a growing conversation in more and more communities, um, especially in the wake of COVID. Um, things kind of radically changed and referrals kind of dropped off a cliff and they've not generally come back up to anything close to pre-pandemic levels. And that can be for a number of different reasons. But I think one of the things we've seen and are concerned about is that um, young people, and we've had some conversations with folks here in Delaware County about young people kind of not hitting the formal youth legal system until they've done something really serious or things have really gone off the rails. That's not good. We definitely don't want that to occur. It's not to say we want to bring more and more kids into the system unnecessarily, but there does seem to be a missed connection there um, where those kids could have had an earlier intervention. There could have been something done to intervene. There could have been an attempt made in the community um, that might have set them on a better pathway. So we're looking um, to work with probation um, to obtain data to help inform um, the report and recommendations that we'll be doing. Um, we don't have that data yet. Um, we're behind where we had expected to be, but um, we've appreciated the partnership with juvenile probation and the court. And I can say, having looked at a first draft of a data tool that incorporates um, detention data and referral data, I think we're on the cusp of being able to kind of open a universe of data that will be incredibly rich, incredibly informative, and help make the case for those additional supports and um, interventions. One of the things that we're really trying to look at is um, those early, early touch points in the system. So we're not doing a deep data dive into every single aspect of the system. But this is one um, uh, chart that came out of the Pennsylvania Juvenile Justice Task Force report in 2021. And it's old data, it's 2018 data, um, but it's a slide or a chart that helped make the case that diversion was being underutilized in many counties as, a, um, as an option for first time 
referrals to the youth legal system. And there was actually a reference in the task force report about thinking about restorative practices and how those could fit into a diversion continuum. So what I'll say on the data is stay tuned. We're excited. We have a great data partner, a nationally recognized data partner um, in the organization Impact Solutions, E-M-P-A-C-T. Um, they have been one of the NEE Casey Foundation's go-to um, organizations for data analysis as part of the Casey Foundation's juvenile justice work. And they've been able to do some really remarkable work. And I think we're gonna see the fruits of that um, sooner than later. One other thing that we have been taking a look at is um, of the programs and resources that are contracted through the county right now, um, and what's available, um, what is missing, um, and what could be added um, uh, to those programs, or how could they be used potentially as uh, more front end diversion options. So we are looking to see where there are gaps programmatically um, based on what's currently available. Um, and we also want to identify ways that we can ensure that if organizations are going to serve as a diversion option, are they being successful in engaging young people and families? And are they getting the outcomes that we would hope them to get if they are going to serve as that front end um, diversion option? So those are really two of the big priorities. We're not, I wanna be clear, and we've tried to be clear with partners here in Delco, we're not doing a formal program evaluation of all the contracted services available in Delaware County. Probation and the court is taking advantage of a terrific opportunity with Georgetown University called the Standard Standardized Program Evaluation Protocol, which does look to assess the effectiveness of services within the JJ continuum. So that work is happening. That's great. That's really not what we're focused on here. Again, we're looking at gaps and ways we could structure kind of agreements uh, with providers so that um, we could be confident that they're getting the outcomes that we would want them to um, achieve. So in terms of diversion options, I think um, one of the things that we've seen um, is that there's a real opportunity um, to look at primary um, prevention opportunities and beef those up and try to utilize those more as a direct diversion option. Um, the QR code up here, and again, I'll get uh, links, direct links to these resources to uh, the board members, um, that QR code links to a video um, where folks in Pierce County, Washington, um, talk about how they've layered in and kind of just pro-social opportunities into their approach to working with young people, not just on probation, but in terms of diversion. And um, if you go to that link or scan that code, um, you'll hear um, the administrator of their juvenile court, TJ Bowl, talk about how they recognize they had evidence-based services, they had services that they were relying on, they don't wanna move away from those or abandon those, but there was also just a desperate need for things that are developmentally appropriate for kids to do. And that those kind of programs and connections are things that will last beyond when a young, hopefully beyond when a young person is involved with the court or on probation. So it's a really great um, like five or six minute video that kind of tells that story. And we're seeing more and more jurisdictions kind of work to develop those diversion options that are not necessarily a teen court or a youth aid panel, but just a program or a resource or a connection um, that that young person can engage with to hopefully see that there is a different approach, a different path, and to get them um, on a better track. Um, two, two other things, because I want to be mindful of time and um, take questions. One kind of significant gap that we've seen in the resource array, especially around diversion in Delaware County, is around the use of restorative practices. Um, it's our understanding that um, Back in the past, there was um, some capacity to facilitate um, restorative conversations and conversations with victims, but our understanding of that is that capacity um, either no longer exists or is significantly diminished. That is something that we're seeing many, many jurisdictions double down on and get really great results. And I'm happy to share some of that research with the board in terms of young people reoffending at far lower rates when they go through a restorative process versus being diverted through the court system or processed through the court system. And then also 
um, having much, much higher rates of victim satisfaction, 90 plus percent um, in some jurisdictions where they've um, done some good research. So I'm happy to share those resources, but that is one thing just kind of off the bat. There's a real potential there. And it's not to say that every case would um, be a good candidate um, for restorative practices. It's not to say that every victim would want to engage in that kind of approach, but we've seen it used more and more, and again, with really great results. And one of the reasons I think the results are so impactful is that um, it's an opportunity for a young person to potentially more meaningfully process the harm they've caused to their community, to a victim, to make amends for that and to have a greater appreciation of that than they might otherwise have if they're referred to court and then they're not um, you know, seeing probation intake for 30 days after that, and then it may be even longer before um, they're actually in court and coming to some kind of um, uh, closure of their case. So a more timely response and a potentially more impactful response, both for the young person and the community. The other thing I want to point out um, is that in our review of um, the county contracts, it does seem there are metrics in terms of kind of what providers are um, being held accountable for, but it's not necessarily at the level that um, we would want to see to be confident that those providers are getting the outcomes that we would hope that they would get. So I'll give you one example, and you can see up here that last bullet, <clears throat> performance measures for community-based organizations. What kind of data are being kept and analyzed on engagement with young people and families? what kind of data are being kept around completion, successful completion of those services, um, and what kind of other um, data can be captured um, around the effectiveness of those services. I'll share in one other jurisdiction where we did a deep dive into their diversion services, they were really using two main diversion options um, at the point of arrest. One was their restorative uh, response provider, and the other was teen court and teen court was getting the bulk of the referrals. Well, it, and they had a contract and they had, um, they had to report on the number of referrals that they received. And that was how they justified their ongoing funding. When we went in and started looking at the engagement rates for young people with teen court, it turned out that only about a fifth of kids who were referred to teen court ever even engaged with the program. And then only about half of those ended up seeing teen court through and the steps that they were required to take to completion. Um, and there were a bunch of reasons that that was happening. And so there was a plan to improve the referral process and the engagement process. But it was really important to know that because to think that you're referring a young person and diverting a young person to something meaningful that is intended to have an impact and then for that not to happen we would agree that that's, you know, we don't want that to happen. We want a young person to be connected um, with something that's meaningful. So um, one of the things that we've seen, and I think we'll um, do some additional um, probing about is kind of how those contract um, performance measures could be structured for diversion opportunities like this, or really any opportunity um, to provide services to kids in a way where you'd be able to get that accountability. And it's not just to put the screws on folks, but it's really to identify if we're not successfully engaging with young people and families with this program, what else could we be doing to help engage or help up those engagement efforts? And then um, the last thing that I'll share, and I'm happy to take questions, um, is that we are doing a landscape analysis of uh, community-based organizations. There is a separate survey um, that is out um, that we developed in partnership with Molly um, Barker Cook of the National Assessment Center, um, marrying kind of the National Assessment Center's methodology to asset mapping with the way we approach it at CCLP. And there are a lot of consistencies to really try to look at what's currently available, what might not be used as a diversion option, but could with additional resources or um, with additional information. And so we're asking folks to kind of raise their hand and say, we're not currently doing this now, but here are the services we offer and we might be willing to do so, or we'd at least be willing to learn more and have a conversation. And that's gonna help us try to identify, again, those resources in the communities where we know um, kids are coming from uh, to kind of build out those direct community-based um, diversion options. So um, with that, I'll pause. Molly, I know you're on by Zoom. I don't know if there's anything um, 
or if that I, if I can even do that, um, I should ask the board whether it would be okay to ask Molly if she had any additional comments that you wanted to add about where we're at. Yeah, please. If Great. Does. Molly, did you have anything? I don't have anything at this time. I think you covered it great, Jason. Thank you. Okay, did one thing right today. Maybe, maybe. So with that, I'll stop. Again, we're really grateful for your time. I'm sweating because, not because I'm nervous. I just get really passionate about this. We think there's tremendous potential here. Um, and we feel uh, a real sense of privilege to be able to work with the folks here to try to improve outcomes for kids. So happy to take questions and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zaney. Um, just want to recognize that the chair is in the room. Um, I don't know, Kevin, you want to take the baton or am I doing okay? Well, you were doing great, so I'm not sure it's necessary. But, uh, <laughs> All right. Um, do we have any questions from the board uh, about the presentation or Mr. Arizari, do you want to add, add any content? What's been? Yeah, just quickly, I, I want to thank James Colston and Refuse to Quit Academy for helping us collect the youth perspective as well as our, our warden, uh, Laura Williams, for allowing us to come down and meet with uh, some young people down at uh, George W. Hill. Thank you. So I just had, uh, I guess, a quick question uh, or observation, if possible. Um, the data that, you, that you're that you sharing, that you're putting together is tremendous and uh, greatly appreciate it. I, I'm just wondering, how does this get shared to the, the judges, the law enforcement, and the people who are actually on the ground, schools um, and probation and parole, you know, it's one thing for us to get it, and we can certainly do um, make decisions based on it. Sure. But they're going to—they're the ones that actually have yep. to use it. So, how does that connect, and at what point does it connect? I appreciate the question, Reverend Turner. Um, and um, part of why we built in um, a data partner to help us kind of. And I wish I could show you guys what they're working on because it really is great. Um, was to do some capacity building so that data we're not just doing a snapshot for this assessment, leaving it in Delco, and then saying, you know, good luck and we'll see you later. The tool that's being developed right now is interactive. It has the ability to be updated in real time, and the intention is to bring that tool and those data exactly before those folks. So we have a juvenile justice um, leadership council that Annie has been helping to coordinate here within the county um, and they'll be getting access to that information. And then I also know we are standing up a um, an impl implementation committee that will have subcommittees with representatives from law enforcement, schools, um, folks in the community. And the intent is to be able to get that information before those folks um, in a way that's useful and digestible and accessible. And that's part of the great, um, one of the great things that MPAC Solutions brings to this work is they want to make the data accessible and usable and no pun intended, but it is um, impactful um, for the folks um, who are using it. So I think the goal will be to get that information before that implementation committee, the subcommittee, so that um, folks can use it in a way that's productive. But I appreciate the question. Other questions? I had a question. Um, the youth group that you collected information from at George Hill, I'm curious, was there any further discussion after that quote left off but it shouldn't be here. There should be a consequence. I'm curious from the perspective of the juvenile offenders incarcerated, if there was more discussion of what then? Mr. Arizari, could I tap you for that? Because I actually, I'm reporting on it. I wasn't actually, I didn't have the good fortune to um, be part of that group, but um, Mr. Arizari and Nelson Walker and Annie Ambrose um, were. I had the privilege of actually meeting with that group and conducting those questions. Um, I, again, so there was acknowledgement of, of and the, the, the question was asked in two different series. Number one was, what was their belief uh, should happen to a young person who could commit somewhat of a lower level offense? And they gave their perspective on that. And then, you know, when we talked about some of the higher uh, possible allegations, you know, attempt to homicide, murders, et cetera, um, that's when that quote came out was, well, we acknowledge that something should happen, right? We uh, we believe that, you know, young people who commit that level of offense should be held accountable. Uh, and when and I think the quote around not a place like this was really just based around an adult prison. They believe that they should have been uh, in a juvenile facility um, that's a bit more equipped 
uh, to them. And I won't get into the details and some of the issues they have with being an adult an adult uh, facility, um, but it was really just based around that. So when they said not like this, it was essentially uh, not here in an adult prison as a minor. That's Thank you. I didn't mean to punt on you, but I thought yeah, like, you could get the that's information that's directly. Really helpful. <laughs> Jason, I, I uh, heard uh, earlier in the report that you were a bit behind on the timing that you had you had hoped at this point. Yeah. Um, any, and maybe you you said this and I missed it, but do you have a sense of kind of where you're hoping to kind of get things wrapped up? And I think a two part question: Is there anything that the county can be doing to support your work better, uh, the county or this board? I really appreciate. Um, both of those questions. Um, so what I will say is our contract um, is up at the end of November. It is, we have every intention of completing on time. I think where we're furthest behind is around the data collection um, and getting that data um, from probation. But like I said, um, I, we had a really great conversation with our data partners this morning. I think we're close. And then um, we'll be able, the way that they're collecting and presenting the data, I think we'll be able to move forward quickly. So um, at this time, I think I would just love for or if you're getting um, requests from us as we kind of build out this implementation team, we don't want it to just be this kind of insular group. We know that for this work to be effective, it really has to have a broad uh, range of representation. So folks on this board um, and on the council have made great suggestions for who to connect with and who to include. Um, so we may need you to do some arm twisting um, on our behalf just to say, hey, you know, we think this is worthwhile. It would be a good investment of your time, but we can keep you apprised of that for sure. And perhaps just as a follow-up later, just to sure. remind us of those arms to be twisted. At, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be restorative in nature, not uh, assaultive. Um, but yeah, thank you for those questions. Um, I'd like to ask, I I understand you made it very clear this is not an assessment of the programs that are out there. I Will there be any sort of assessment or benchmarking about some of the numbers of our system, the number of kids we have in probation uh, compared to our neighbors, the number of of um, you, you know the extent to not necessarily qualitative analysis of sure. the diversionary programs, but what we have in place now, where we stand. Yes, yes, and I think um, in our conversations with um, Mr. Rosari, um, that is one of the big um, things we want to get out of this: is kind of where are we at now, so that we can have a more clear-eyed kind of assessment of where, again, those strengths are and where those opportunities are. So yes, that is our intention to be able to establish kind of that baseline and capture things. And because Pennsylvania does have um, great data capacity in terms of the um, JCJC, um, we should be able to make those comparisons with peer jurisdictions. Um, is, it, is it correct that there's also some of that comparative data currently available in the task force reports? Yes, so we can there is. See how Delco measures up. There is, okay. yes. And again, it's a, it's dated at this point, um, but those um, they do have a number of um, uh, charts and tables that compare Delaware County to other counties throughout the Commonwealth. And, and excuse me, the, and your report will include, because uh, I, th I thought I heard you say, but I just want to make sure that I write it down here, um, some best practices on models and how models yes. can be used as it relates to um, the partners, the people that are actually providing the services for our young people. Absolutely. Yes, you're correct. Thank you. And I had a question about the scope. So uh, you're looking at front end diversion and how front are you? <laughs> how front is front. So, yeah. I mean, so specifically, I'm curious about law enforcement diversion. I think that's traditionally been undercaptured, right? Yep. Because if uh, you know a kid is engaging in a behavior and an officer just says, go home, right? I'm not taking you and go home, that's a diversion. Is there any way to sort of capture that? Or are you trying to capture that? Or are you looking at diversion once a young person, only once a young person has had like formal contact, they've been processed in some way? So it's a great question um, and I'll, there are kind of two responses to that. I think why we are um, requesting and trying to use the probation referral and intake data is because we know that that is a solid data point that we can look to, okay, these are the kids who are actually touching the system. To your point about law enforcement level data, one of the reasons we want to have the probation data available is to say, okay, here are the three biggest feeder 
cities or towns in Delco. Let's go to law enforcement and see what data they have on the diversions that are happening if they have it. That has been a very weak spot in our experience. You have law enforcement agents, you have, uh, and I forget how many there are here in um, Delaware County, but you have law enforcement agencies potentially using all sorts of different data systems, um, may not be capturing data on diversions or may only be capturing certain kind of data on diversions. So maybe not capturing um, a sidewalk adjustment where they just say, you know, get out of here, you did something wrong, but um, you know, I'm not gonna make an arrest or a referral. Um, that may not be captured. And so it can be tough to get at that. I think we want to try, especially in the jurisdictions that are the highest feeders of kids and kids of color. Um, but we also don't want the best to be the enemy of, of the good and stop us kind of in our tracks from exploring those, those opportunities. I hope that. Yeah, it does. And, and I know folks probably have other questions, but just to piggyback on that one. And another curiosity I had was about judges, right? So a judge can only order a kid to a program that they're aware of, right? And if they're not, so I wondered if um, there was some conversation about, I don't know if it's surveys, focus groups, or some other mechanism, you guys would be expert at that, I don't know. But um, to figure out what judges know about what's available in the community. Because if, you know, they're just not aware um, that those alternatives exist, they will not order a kid to that. And the other question would be, and I guess this is for other folks, um, maybe not you, Jason, whether or not, um, perhaps Judge Nichols knows this, whether or not a judge can court order a kid to a program with which the county does not have a contract, does not have a formal relationship, mm -hmm. could they say, you need to join a mentoring program? And uh, the J the juvenile probation officer needs to identify an appropriate mentoring program, even if, um, to that judge's knowledge, there is not a mentoring program that's on the roster of diversion alternatives. So I know this is getting to be a long question. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a good but one. Then, it's a good one. And also thinking about whether or not JPOs have a similar mechanism to sort of it's not on the list of county contracted services. I can identify it. I can recommend it to judge A and judge A can say, sounds good to me. This is where I want this young person. So is there um, a way for you to capture that? And if not, I would, you know, wonder whether or not that's something you might ask of the county no. whether or not you could expand your scope a little bit. Sure, sure. No, I think it's a, I think it's a great point. I think we have had um, some conversations with um, the judicial officers here, but and with probation, but I think there are more certainly that could be had about what they're currently using. And one of the things, our hope, even though you know I've said we're not doing an assessment of probation um, or the courts, um, one of the hopes is by identifying these additional diversion pathways and opportunities that probation and your judicial officers would see them as resources and additional options um, to which to refer you, including options and programs that may be in youth's own communities as opposed to a different part of the county so that they can have kind of a more of a natural relationship. But I think that's a really good um, point. And I think we can do some more digging on that front to um, try to at least get some qualitative information on what's being leaned on um, most heavily in terms of diversion options. I think that's, that's a great, great suggestion. I know the board has seen many times now, I think folks coming in and they represent a community-based program and they say, we do all of this cool stuff and we've never heard of them, right? Yep. Or the courts may yep. not have heard of them. So I was curious. Let me have a follow-up based upon what you asked. Have you done any work with the Juvenile Court Judges Commission of Pennsylvania? Uh, it's been um, many moons since we've worked with them officially. Give me an idea of what a moon is. <laughs> a year, uh, two years? I mean, what? About, um, I think it's been eight or nine years since we've had wow. kind of an official relationship. I will say we are working with JCJC around the data um, and have connected with folks there. So, um, you know, we think incredibly highly of them um, and all of the state, um, the Chiefs Association here in Pennsylvania is a real resource too. So um, definitely are familiar. I just want to, I don't want to overstate right, kind right. of a working relationship. Well, I asked them. that, it seemed to me based on everything you've said that this is something that the Juvenile Court Judges Commission would be interested in sure. because it affects the entire state, the Commonwealth. Yep. So anyway, I'll, I'll try to follow up with a couple of people I know there. That's great. Thank okay. you, Judge Nichols. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have heard based even on the initial conversations around the data um, that there is interest within JCJC about kind of what we're doing and the methodology okay. and um, 
what will come out in terms of data. There's really good capacity um, within the Commonwealth. Um, but I think, you know, they, like us, are looking to opportunities to um, continue to up their game and, and um, provide the best possible information. And uh, Judge Nichols, we had the opportunity to present this project out to the JCJC uh, through our partner, uh, Anne Marie uh, and Ambrose. We were able to bring them down. We sat down with them as well as our own local courts, present this project out. They have a great interest in what we're doing. And they've also talked about uh, statewide. This is something that they're asking most jurisdictions, if not all, to shift toward. And uh, in fact, I believe their, their, their uh, statewide conference is going to be focused on initiatives very similar to this and building community capacity. So we have included them thus far. Uh, Annie and I have met with their leadership numerous times, and they have a great interest in what we're doing here in DOCO. Great. Thank you. Yep. Remaining questions? All right. If not, thank, thank you for you your so time. Much, Mr. Zane. So uh, we do you, were there, was there anything else you want to close out with? Okay. All right, great. So we will move on to any old business. Facility size is bulleted. So, um, whomever wanted to raise that issue on the board, now would be your time. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take that. So, um, this is something that I think we, we touched on a couple months ago and, uh, wanted to bring it back to the, the board for discussion. Um, and as a general matter, I think until we have, you know, shovel in the ground, um, the plans around uh, a center um, are fluid. I think we should continue to um, revise them based on, you know, the most recent information. Um, and so I did want to bring it back to the uh, board's consideration, the current um, draft layout for three pods of eight, and if that was in fact uh, the right size to be building. Um, something that we heard, I think, frequently in some of the comments from our community meetings was, why build so big, right? If you look at the census data of what we had prior to the shutdown, when I think at the time of shutdown, there were only two children or two to four, I can't remember exactly what the number was. Um, and since that time, it's it's really kind of hovered in that five-ish kind of a range, five to six. Um, why are you talking about 24? And I think the answer is somewhat more complicated than might immediately meet the eye in that, you know, you do have to have separation between male and female and um, youths that are uh, younger than a certain age, they tend to be housed with um, with females, is my understanding, Mr. Azari. Um, and then also sometimes there are, there's a need to sort of separate two children who are you know, I just can't be in the same pod. And so you get to a point where it's not like every bed is created equal. Um, but nevertheless, it did seem like there was some um, justification for reconsidering it in light of of the, the census numbers. So I asked David to look at um, just exactly, you know, a high threshold point that we've seen over the last now couple of years. And when I said earlier, you know, we have more data since we first put this forward. We do. We have several months more since we first talked about 24. Um, does that, you know, make us think that something less than three times eight is right? Um, and also, what would be the implications um, from a practical matter if we, you know, hit a point where we have more than three times six would would allow for? What practically speaking would the county do? Um, and lastly, what would be the, the budgetary implications? So if we were to reduce the size, we asked the architect, what would be the budgetary impact on the expected cost for um, for the construction? So David, I don't know if you want to, from there, kind of take it to what your, your output is to the board in that regard. Yeah, I, th I think for me, I'll just use the time to kind of present on some of the numbers that I talked about uh, in our May meeting. And we just, when we kind of just talked about um, some of our highs, right, and looking at our last year's uh, data, you know, the most young people we've seen uh, in detention on a weekly basis uh, was 12, right, highest, uh, the highest amount reported in terms of need, and we base need off of how many kids were actually in detention and how much young people that are partners at probation um, 
you know, gave us a decibel on how many young people they had to turn away before the lack of resource, uh, which was on a weekly basis was 11. That's a combination of how many young people were actually in detention as a, and with a combination of how many young people were scored for detention and were turned away uh, was 11. And I think one thing we collectively kind of got caught up on as a group was, you know, in June of last year, uh, the reported need was 17, right? And that was a combination of 11 young people turned away um, with uh, actually seven who were in detention. Um, and I think we kind of, we've kind of lost, uh, in, in my perspective, uh, what the ask was from Mr. Madden in terms of would 18 suffice, right? reducing from 24 to 18. I think the data shows that even on our worst month last year, um, the amount of, um, beds available if we had a 18 bed facility would suffice. Um, and again, the, the largest amount of young men that we've seen at one point in time um, was 10. So having two pods of, of six each gives us 12 beds for, for young men. Again, we, it, it, it would work out. And the large amount of young ladies, or at least uh, those who identify as female, would have been four. So having, you know, one female uh, pod of four would work and there still would be potentially two available beds if there was a younger person, uh, 10 or 11 years old. Um, and again, we saw out in Bucks County that they housed their younger males with um, females um, to keep them a bit more safe. So again, based off those numbers, um, again, Mr. Madden's asked in terms of, hey, can we reduce it? And again, in terms of cost savings, that would be a $500,000 uh, reduction would would that be something that works? I know he wants us to revisit that com conversation based off of the numbers that we did have available. Um, and again, looking forward to hearing the board's perspective on on that. And David, just two other points to add in. I think when you talk about that peak of 11 turnaways in one month, that was a wild outlier, right? I think if you yeah. turn, put that aside um, in any other month besides that one, the most that we saw um, it was a, a fraction of that, but I don't, do you have that exact number? I do. I do. Um, it was four. So 11 was a real, you know, yep. anomaly. Um, and I think we have to understand that there's some limitations around that data. We, we were not able to get back from juvenile detention. I'm sorry, from, uh, probation, whether there were repeats in that, right? So from a practical matter, if of the 11, it was actually three youths who just kept, you know, being brought in and absconded. And, you know, that's entirely possible of what was going on, especially in light of the fact that it was such a wild spike. Um, so we don't know exactly whether that was truly 11 unique individuals or if there were recurrences within that. Um, and the second, I think, important thing to keep in mind is it's not as if with a new facility, we're going to remove the contracts that we have with other counties. So if we do find ourselves in a bind for a very limited period of time, um, we can um, lean upon, and I know that's that's more a fallback, it's not what we want to, but if we have some, something happens that is outside of normalcy and we need to temporarily tap into Chester County or Montgomery County or one of the other facilities we currently use, as we currently do, that is there. So, um, my takeaway from it was that I think it, it merits reduction, but uh, I'm only one voice. So I just have a question for clarification for the discussion of decreasing size. Is the rationale of the concerns money? So a financial concern that we would have a reduction in the cost. Is it space that otherwise could be used for something? Is it waste, um, which is pretty reasonable to to be concerned about perception more beds means that potentially people could feel less likely to think of community resources and options and just well if there's a bed there's you can put a kid there um or all of the above, <laughs> above am i do i have that kind of summarized i mean i think everyone may have a different answer for me it's it's personally it's a combination of a few of them Sure. Um, certainly a half a million dollars is a half a million dollars. Sure. It's something that you can do a lot with sure. as opposed to building beds that aren't going to be used. Um, I do think perception matters. I think we've heard that there is a range of views on the building of a facility in Delaware County. And um, for, you know, I, I think people to see 24 beds being built, um, it 
may appear to some that we are building for a you know criminal and just criminal uh, industrial complex that um, that we don't really advocate for. Understood. Thank you. So I you know I think perception is an important part of it. If we reduce the size or whatever process we took to explore that as an option, does that also impact? And I think this is a question from Mr. Irizarry, the planned approach to staffing the services. Like the half a million dollars is is a savings of what? Is it also a is included in that? Is that staff expenses oh, as it. well? I think, and David, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that was just the brick and mortar construction mm -hmm. costs. I don't think it would impact how we would view staffing. Um, but again, it's a half a million dollars you can reinvest somewhere else in some other way. Sure. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning if for some reason, and, and this would absolutely not be what we would desire, but if the circumstances in Delaware County change at some uncertain point down the road where for some reason we do need more than six times three beds, the way it's structured is such that you could, you know, extend uh, the pods by adding it, you know, a few more beds in one or more of those pods. So it's not as if you are, you know, burning the ships um, and, and isolating yourself in a particular uh, direction. So, so only, the only question that I have, or a question that I have is, in light of what is happening in Philadelphia, I just want to be clear that we're sure that we are not, in reducing, that we are not put, putting ourselves as you said, you know, right now the lowest number we had is four. So, you know, we're way long ways off from that. Right. But I just want to make sure that, you know, the um, state or no one else comes back to us later on and says, you know, you're at your num your capacity numbers consistently and you need to make sure that your ratios and all those other things line up. And so I just, I don't know if that's an, it's an issue or if it's something totally different. I, I'm not sure I understood the question. So you so think in Philadelphia, yeah. um, they were recently, as of last week, um, they were mandated to move young people um, simply because there were not enough beds and the ratio of staff to, to young people was way off. Um, and so, and it was because they had a limited number of beds. So I, I just want to make sure that our ratio um, is always whatever is best practice versus that we reduced it by six pot, you know, six beds. And that's what throws us off as opposed to the 24, you know. I would turn it to the experts, but I, I, if I, what I'm hearing you right is the reason they were lacking capacity was because of staffing challenges. Right. Uh, well, so, well, a combination of staffing and staffing and space and, and space, right? I mean, we have we have Nelson Walker here who could who could speak to that, but but if I understand what's happening in Philadelphia, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, the problem isn't that they don't have enough beds. The problem is that they have too many kids, and the distinction between that is that they have capacity for I think it's 160 young people, and. 184 young people and they've exceeded that such that they're now at about 230. Mm -hmm. So what that's and, and so the ratios of course will be off because the facility was never intended to serve 230 youth. But we would have in fact the opposite problem here if we don't over incarcerate our youth. I mean it it, it sort of speaks for itself. So I think it 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 sort of um for me underscores the importance of the diversion and the front end diversion uh, conversation, it doesn't speak to a need for us to build a bigger facility. Because, and, and not just because, you know, some board members would prefer it, but because the numbers don't indicate it. Like we, they just don't. Right, and, so, and, what, and what I'd add to that is if instead of looking toward Philadelphia, we look in other directions, I think you've got stakeholders at a state level who are saying when you've got significant availability in some of your neighboring counties, why are you building such a massive facility? Um, and I think that also has to be thrown into the context for sizing here. I'm cool. not indicating a position on this. Um, in fact, um, I, I, I'm not indicating a position at this point. However, we have to be realistic that the crime, serious crimes are going up, unfortunately, while I certainly am an advocate for diversion diversionary programs and a lot of a lot of other type of programs we just have to understand where where our society is today 
that the, the serious crimes of violent crimes are going up and the offenders are getting younger. And that is a major concern that we're all dealing with across the United States. And so I'm not necessarily indicating that Delaware County is going to be in some sort of crisis. We're doing all of our parts to reduce that. And we've seen a reduction here in Delaware County, but just realistically understanding where we are in a world. Um, and certainly, you I mean, know, I, I will say, a concern, but, I, I'd also but, it's, say but it's also incorrect. Serious crime is not going up and a greater proportion is not being committed by young people. So I think, you know, we have to we have to make these decisions based on, you know, what's real and what's perception. And I think it sort of underscores what the chair said, that perception is important. There is a perception that serious crime is going up. There's also a perception that more of those crimes are being committed by young people and Neither of those things are actually true. Well, yeah, and, and, and we could debate that, but I, I see, I, you know, working in the field um, here just in Delaware County, I'm telling you right now that we're getting more serious crimes of juvenile offenders victimizing individuals. And so we've never seen that. But I think if I could just jump in, I, putting aside narratives, and I, I think we all get caught up in narratives at a national level and a local level, and we look at statistics. If we actually look at what we are currently seeing here in the face of this narrative that says crime is getting you know, higher and it's going toward more youth. I don't think we need to debate whether or not that's true. We can just actually look at the numbers that sure. we're seeing. Um, and the numbers we're seeing support that we don't need more than three times six or 18 beds. Yeah, I would say, I mean, for me, it's helpful to pair it back to what our obligation is here. What is our obligation at this board? It's, we have an obligation to house the very, very small minority of children who, for the public safety, need to be housed and, or for their own safety. It's a very small number. That's what we should be designing for, that small number. And, and we have the proof of what that number is. And all, you know, the numbers we've seen this year are the elevated numbers. So that's what I think we should design for that very small number of the tiny percentage of children who need to be housed for their own safety or for the safety of others. As long as, as, long as we're gonna have an addendum, and the addendum is that the half a million dollars that we save, if we do this, we make sure we put it in the community programs and you know that we, that we don't take it off the table totally, but we continue to reuse it or make sure that it's never, that programmatically, we are continually doing the things that we talked about, we heard about today, and, and getting as many groups as involved as possible. So not just savings for the, for the sake of savings. I agree with you. I, well, my, my position or my thought is 18 beds is probably more than enough or enough. Um, but I do want to make sure that uh, as we saw when we were in various communities, that if there's an opportunity to provide, and this may not be this board's responsibility, but that dollars are made available to get programs and support programs in communities. So, you know, all of that. And again, right now we're only focusing on what's our what's our responsibility. Our responsibility, as Elaine just said, is to build the right size and to make sure <laughs> we're doing that work. So let's do that. But, you know, let's... And look, I, th I think making such a statement by this board would be reflective of what words we have been saying over the past few years, which is investing in resources. So. Right. Um, I have a question. Um, do we actually have the ability to redirect, save monies to specific initiatives or strategies because it Probably doesn't feel like we have that authority no, so while I, you know my position on this is well three three of you have the ability to advocate for it right and like maybe three vote for it and vote for it and maybe that's enough to get us to that point but i just want to because i agree with you it's like saving money is one thing but what we heard when we went from community to community community is like why are you guys building this facility when we don't have a basketball court that kids can go to and we actually don't have some of the resources and i think that those were like municipality issues, not necessarily county council issues. And so I don't want to give the false 
perception to anybody who's watching this that by making one decision, it's also a yes for the things that they've been asking for. Because if we don't have the authority, I just don't want to give that perception. I, if we are stating our position or perspective, we've looked at this since this week over week over week, at least I have for two years straight. And the numbers are definitely, it, it feels to me like 18 beds are um, sufficient, if not more than sufficient. I think the unknown that I still feel like we don't have a good handle on are those young people who are currently in the pipeline and housed um, in places where they should not be. And I don't I don't have a good sense. Data that's missing to further give me confidence in this space is how what's their average length of stay and what's our responsibility to those students because we are seeing pretty clear data about new incidents and the numbers are relatively small and have been um but it that seems to be a part of our responsibility that we don't have consistent information about at least i don't feel like we're getting that information are you referring to youth have, who have been adjudicated or youth who are waiting for this interest of justice hearing, but also youth who are have, have committed adult crimes, but are, are housed with adult facilities. Like, I don't know how big that universe is on any given time. And I think part of the reason why we're in this is because we don't have a place to house them. So now they're put in these other harm's way. And I remember us talking about that population as a part of the formula to get to the number. And I, I see people shaking their heads. So I'm like, but I'm not making this up. I was, I think. So, so for instance, the five that are at George W. Hill, you know, are they, when we include the numbers, they would then, if they were, if all things were equal, they would be in this facility. Um, no, not all of them, but right. So yeah, I guess. But that's, that's, unknown. Unknown. that's X for me. But it will always be an X because the because unfortunately the juvenile justice system churns, right? So right. by the time this facility were to be built in 2025, those young people would no longer be a factor. And there's no way to predict whether or not we would have lesser numbers. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like what you're asking is if we were to bring every kid who is in a facility that would have been Lima back to uh, yeah. the new facility, how many kids would that be today? That's or, a version of or, the question. Yeah. I, and I, I hear what you're saying. We, we It's not a predictive thing that I'm asking for, even if it's a range. Mm -hmm. It might range from A to B. There, there is some knowable universe about this population and that's the unknown. I, I don't need it to be specific or even you know 100% accurate. But for me, I think we do have an obligation to that population and we're not often talking about that population. But just so to be clear, I, I think the pre-adjudicated numbers, the, the youth that are in detention, we do have that and we know length of stays. Uh, we know those who are at George W. Hill or at um, youth centers throughout the state. We have those numbers. I think the part that perhaps what you were saying is the post adjudicated numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, I don't really understand how that would sort of drive. No, is there I feel like we're not getting, I guess for me, we get incremental information about a group of kids. And what we see regularly are currently of offenses that we see every week. We don't get this information that you're talking about regularly on that list of kids. Well, I think, so I think what, so the thing to remember is that the kids in detention are in detention. They're not post-adjudicated right. kids, right? So that number is always in flux. Sure. So, so if you're asking about kids who would be there, I, I guess I don't understand what this population is. It feels like we're talking about two different populations right, when yeah. we're having this conversation. Yeah. And what I'm saying is one, we get regular information on. And if you ask me to compare 18 beds to that list, I say, absolutely, that is sure. And the other set of, and, and maybe I misunderstood, but I thought that there's another set of kids that we would be responsible for that we are not because of the types of crimes that they are committed to and we don't have a facility. No, okay. there's no other population. Direct file kids and the interest of justice kids are pre-adjudicated. Yeah, we have those and so numbers. We'll not, all... We don't have to account for them over a long haul. Yeah, there's no extra population that we're not accounting for. Okay. I mean, the only other population there is is post-adjudicated, but they're not going to be at Lima. Not and Kirsten and Danielle, if I'm correct, inform us when they had no other choice that they had to put the child back into the community, which in in any other situation they would have had or the judge would have recommended detention or probation would have recommended detention. So there are some 
And that's kind of what I was talking about is not that I want our world moving forward to get worse, but there is a population that if juvenile probation felt that there wasn't, you know, if you don't, you don't want to get like your back up against the wall that we don't have enough space. I don't believe that to be the issue, but to consider those few times where Danielle and Kirsten have told us that they had nowhere else to go. So they had to put them in the community. And some of those children actually cut off the ankle bracelets and, and ate, you know, ran. Um, those are a few numbers that we've heard over the time here be serving on the board, but that's another population. So even considering them, do we have enough beds? Do, and certainly we, we were taking those, those into yes, consideration. On that was system. what David was referencing when he said we had that one spike of a month in June of Thinking, last year. Then my apologies that so that's I all included understood. That's what I was just hoping that we yep. could take in consideration those. And I, I, I apologize if that was those, those numbers that David was included. Yes, I know you were trying to speak. Please jump in. Um, I just wanted to know if um, there were any conversations with the district attorney's office or anyone from probation or the courts about potentially reducing the numbers if they express any support or, or concerns. I have personally spoken with the DA about this. I have. So just to clarify, unless there are other comments, are you all asking for a decision point or are we, is this sort of a, a notification that we're going to ask the ar architect to- I would like to bring this to a vote. And, okay. and again, I'd like to make it clear that this is only a, this is this board's view. Um, it's something that ultimately needs to be approved by any changes to what ultimately is constructed. Um, that needs to be approved by county council, mm -hmm. but county council as a member of it, um, I certainly look to what this board's um, guidance is as to what is necessary. Okay. Do you wanna... um, and, I, and I'd be happy to support, you know, this change going um, with the addition that the Reverend um, added, which is that such dollars would be invested in, in community programming Great. as a recommendation to County Council. Great. Do you want to make the motion? I, yeah, I will, I will move that this board um, ask for the architect to amend the the draft um, plans for new facility from three pods of eight to three pods of six with the commensurate savings um, uh, being um, put toward community programming um, as as a direction of this of this board. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Sounds uh, any, unanimous, yes. Any opposed? Are there any opposed? Okay. We haven't heard from the folks online. I don't know that we have any more board members well, we've got uh, Chris. Chris is online. I'm online. Chris, what was your vote on that? Aye. Uh, reluctantly, yes. Okay, great. So it was unanimous. Great. All right, any other old business not on the agenda? <laughs> To new business. Yeah, I think we have one more, one more uh, data point, uh, one more agenda item for old business. We had the opportunity to have a group, community member group, come out uh, last month, and they've asked us to re revise our project's uh, mission statement. And to be uh, clear, this is the mission statement created by our sub, our subcommittee, design committee, as well as the architectural firm. Um, They've asked us to revise it and for it to be a bit more specific. Um, I've sent you all the former statement as well as what was being proposed. I'm looking for a collective agreement on that as well. And David, just to be clear, what you're referring to is not the mission statement of this board. Correct. It's not the mission statement of the uh, department. juvenile de department. detention yep. department. Yep. There was messaging that the architect used um, informed by the design subcommittee that was shared with the community around guidance for, um, you know, how right. they were going to kind of design. Right. right. And well, that, that I think is what you're asking that we revisit. Again. Yeah. I mean, part, part of the architecture uh, process was to start with 
why we're here and what we hope to accomplish, right? And build that into a mission statement. And we were able to go out to different communities and talk about this mission statement, what we're doing. And this particular community um, had some suggestions around revising it and I brought it before the board for their suggestion. And can you just for the public and for us to remind us what the initial language was that the architect was working off of and what uh, we're bringing forth for consideration here? Sure. So the former mission statement says uh, Delaware County inspires to create a new building for juvenile detention uh, for the juvenile detention center at the Lima campus that represents and reflects the values of the county as they strive to create a positive environment that protects our youth and community while simultaneously fulfilling um, the belief that our youth are capable of and deserving of the opportunity to receive support, be happy, and can be contributing members to society. Do not go halfway. Um, the revision was Delaware County will create a progressive cutting uh, edge center dedicated to youth rehabilitation that aligns with county values, fosters a positive environment, protects the mental, uh, emotional, and physical well-being and development of county youth while instilling the youth, uh, instilling in youth that they are uh, capable and deserving of the opportunities and support required uh, to be contributing members of society while simultaneously ensuring the safety of the community. Um, so personally, I, I I don't think either one is terribly bad, um, but I do understand that they're, you know, have, having heard their report from last month, they felt that we needed to hit head on um, a uh, an emphasis on um, supportive programming and and mental and behavioral health of Yep. And so I, I, I'm fine with making the change. I, I, you know, again, it's words do matter, but it's also surrounded by our ongoing dialogue with the architect. Okay. So I, I'd make a motion to, I'd make a motion to make the change. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Nay. We have one opposition to the change in the mission statement. Noted. Um, any other new old business? Sorry, that was the last item of old business. Any other? Nope. New business. All right, hearing nothing, uh, we'll move on to our second round of public comment. Um, inviting folks who come to the podium, name and address, please, before you commence with your uh, statement. And the scope of that, help from the chair, the scope of public comment in this round. Uh, I'm sorry, the scope of public comment. Were... Um, in the second round, anything pertaining to juvenile justice? Yeah, I, I think the, the the second round of public comment is, if, I'll just take here. Yeah. Um, the public comment yeah. second round is as it relates to anything associated with juvenile detention in Delaware County. So if there are folks who would like to address this board or the public, um, please do so now. Um, please start with your name and address and limit your comments to three minutes. Are there any members of the public? All right, hearing none. Um, any last board member comment for today? I do. Um, I'd just like to share something that uh, with the board that I, I obtained from <coughs> looking at a report. Uh, let me just read what I have. I got a copy of the recent report of the National Center for Juvenile Justice compiled by the Office of Juvenile Justice Prevention and others. It is a comprehensive 100-page report giving a number of statistics. It focuses on cases disposed of in 2020 and examined trends since 2005. A note I did not take into account the impact of COVID. Here are the ones I found personally significant and enlightening. The number of cases processed between 2005 and 2019 declined by 69%. The number of cases involving detention decreased by 54% between 2005 and 2020. Black and Hispanic youth represented a larger share of overall detention, caseload rather than the overall delinquency load in 2020. For all these years, person, personal offenses were more likely to result in detention rather than other types of offenses. The percentage of juvenile cases waived to adult court, adult court declined between 2005 and 2020. There was a decrease in cases handled by informal adjustment. The number of cases in which youth were adjudicated delinquent dropped by 75%. The number of cases which resulted in out-of-home placement increased by 76%. Percentage of out-of-home placement was stable at 27%. Several weeks ago, I met with truancy officer at our high school um, and a 
teacher there uh, and spent over two hours going over uh, truancy issues in our local high school. I then spent two hours uh, at truancy hearings with the officer and the teacher from that high school at that ma magisterial court. The reason I did this was that a fellow board member, Reverend Turner, told me that from a conversation with Kristen at JPO that most of our youth who ended up in detention had truancy problems. But it should be noted that the reasons for truancy were as diverse as, diverse as the youth I saw. Examples, body shaming, English as a second language, lack of self-esteem, psychological and emotional issues, teasing, not fitting in, lack of learning skills, socially maladjusted, and family issues. I had so many conclusions, uh, but doing this uh, was something that I thought was important. Uh, and one of the reasons I thought it was important, another reason I thought it was important was that in talking with uh, board member Williams, who informed me that if you're talking about having juveniles not involved in the system, one of the biggest impacts was the lack of a caring adult in their lives. And I think that's something we all need to keep in, in mind that when we talk about these juveniles, there's a lack of a caring adult in their lives. Not that we can do anything about it, but I think we should think about that. I think we are those caring adults in a sense for the lives of these juveniles. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, can I can I make one friendly amendment? Um, I would never contradict the judge, but the quote was caring, consistent adult. Thank you. So the consistency was important and it was around mentoring and the efficacy of mentoring and the keeping kids out of antisocial behavior. They said that was the sort of, I was going to say magic bullet, bad analogy, but I mean, that was the secret in the sauce is to have a caring, consistent yeah. adult. All right. Any other last remarks for today, board members? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad I'm gonna see you show that I have so interesting that that's not